Um, so today we will explore the future of work with our great panelists. Uh, we will focus in particular around the future of work in the respective industries of our panelists, but we also explore the importance of diversity and inclusion, and also we'll discuss the skills that future leaders need to be successful. Um, so I will let our lovely panelists introduce themselves in a second, but before I do that, uh, please let me introduce uh, your flock. Uh, so my name my name is uh, Michał Wisniewski. Uh, don't worry, I won't make you say it. It's a Polish Polish name and surname. You can call me Michael. Uh, so I am the co-founder of your flock. And for those who don't know, uh, we are a Manchester-based employee engagement platform. That's a spin out from the University of Manchester. Uh, effectively, we help team leaders flag people who need support so they can take action and make sure employees are engaged and retained in the team. Uh, in simple words, we effectively help team leaders with action plans and one-to-ones uh, with employees based on employee feedback and their individual core values and motivators. So as a result, uh, we help to create a culture that's more engaged and retained and save time for team leaders. Uh, we're actually super excited to announce that all companies who use your flock for six months or longer have got better employee retention than the industry average, which is excellent news. Uh, we're very proud of it and so, you know it makes our life easier as well because we can prove how much cost savings we can provide based on improved retention. Uh, so that's that's the introduction of your flock and myself. Um, in terms of the um, structure of today's event, we, uh, we will first uh, have a quick discussion uh, for with the panelists for about half an hour to 40 minutes and then we will leave the rest uh, for questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll monitor the chat, ask them at the end, or you can just ask them at the end. Uh, there's no fire alarms. So if you do hear a fire alarm, feel free to leave. We won't be offended. Um, and th so that's uh, your flock. That's the uh, uh, fire alarms. And now let's move on to the panelists. So I'll be the host. I will not speak as much as I did for the past, uh, for the past few minutes. I'll try to be as uh, quiet as possible and give as much time to our lovely panelists as possible. Um, so should we start with introductions? Um, Katie, would you like to start uh, with a quick introduction and then we'll move on to uh, the discussion? Of course, thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Katie Leeson and I'm Managing Director of Social Media Marketing Agency Social Chain. But also, and the reason that I am here today and very passionate about this topic is that I'm on the advisory board for Your Flock and have been for uh, probably about the last six months um, working with the team there. Because um, as we will get into, I think understanding your values and understanding your team dynamics as a leader is really important for the future of work. So I'm really excited to have that discussion today. Thank you. Uh, Mel, would you like to go next? Yeah, hi, I'm Mel Colwell. I'm um, a Learning and Development Manager at Herbert Smith Freehills. For those of you who haven't heard of Herbert Smith Freehills, we're a global law firm. Um, so we're based in about 35 countries, I think. Um, I'm based in sunny Belfast. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm delighted to be here today. There's so much has changed in our industry. Um, and Mikhail and um, your flock and I have been talking just about you know, how we engage some teams who are working fully remotely, which isn't something that has that we've ever done before. Um, so, um, so yeah, delighted to, 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 to be here and to share thoughts and, and perspectives. Thank you, Mel. And Chris, would you like to give us a quick, a quick intro yeah, as well? I'm delighted. Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Walford. I um, co-run a small business psychology uh, consultancy called Sixth Sense. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about people's behavior, obviously, as psychologists and coaches uh, in teams, as individuals. And also we're kind of interested in the way that's changing. Um, noticed it a lot during the, the lockdown, um, blended and remote working. And um, we've, got, we've got some perspectives, I think, which we'd like to share on, on the world of leadership, particularly, and a little bit on diversity as well. Perfect. So thank you for your introduction. As you can see, there's different backgrounds in the panel. So hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Uh, and let's start with the title of the webinar, right? So the future of work. 
So over the past two years, people say we had around 10 years worth of digital transformation. And, you know, we can all see the impact of it. We, you know, some of us work from home. This event is online. And a few years ago, they've probably taken place in a real office. So uh, what do you think uh, a workplace uh, will look like uh, in your respective industries, perhaps in the short term and how it will look like in the long term in the next 10 years? What are the main changes you, had, you would expect to see? Um, and uh, who sh is anyone, does anyone want to take the question? Um, well, I'm happy to start. Um, for us, we are in common with a lot of professional services firms. We're adopting uh, in, the, in the short term, a, a three days in the office, um, two days from home, which sounds, um, sounds quite easy. But for a law firm that works in a very traditional way before, that's, that's quite a step. That's quite a step forward. Um, We've also, um, we're all, and linking to the future, we're also hiring teams now to work anywhere. Um, so we've got teams now who, who work in, you know, different parts of the world that maybe we wouldn't have recruited in before. And I think that really gives us opportunities um, to tap into different talent sources, um, different groups of people linked to our diversity agenda as well. Um, you know, off, opens up markets um, to, our, to us and to our clients. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity. It, it will take work to make that to make that really work because one of the things that's so important to us at Herbs and Fields is our culture. So really getting people to feel, regardless of where you are, who you are, that you're really part of us. And then we'll talk more about inclusivity because that's such a such a uh, a core value for us. But um, it's exciting. It's exciting in terms of a the change and b the talent source. I think um, and and the opportunities that that gives. Okay, so uh, it looks like the, there's much more talent globally that you can explore. But the challenge is how do you keep the talent together to Absolutely. make sure that they still identify themselves with the company. And okay. Um, okay, and what's uh, so, Katie? What's your perspective from you know uh, from your experience in working with social change? Uh, we've always been um, a flexible business, so we've always allowed a degree of flexibility, but the pandemic has obviously increased that by such a level that we've proved that we could work anywhere. But on the flip side of that, the actual reality is we, uh, we've always been known for our culture, and the culture is really the, the heart of what makes us tick and creating great work and enabling creativity between teams. So just this week, we've implemented um, a requirement of at least three days in the office. And that isn't because we want to start dictating where people are or how they work, but it's more so we can get that, get the office feeling like it's living again. I think it was very empty. It felt really, really weird. And our office space is part of who we are. It's part of our, our, identi our identity. So we've, we've incorporated three days back into the office this week. Um, we've got the most incredible happiness manager and her role is really to make sure that everything in the office is good and we've got um, lunch and learns and people coming in to inspire and just building that connection again with the office and bringing the teams together. And we see that beneficiary, beneficiary in so many ways, the creativity, the output, but also the speed that problems are resolved. I think what we noticed in the pandemic is having a team that are all working from home. One person can have a problem and that can manifest itself into a much bigger problem because it can't be discussed in that moment. It then takes a Zoom call or a conversation. And it's, whereas when you're all together, you can quickly sort that out. So for me, I was really keen to get pe many people back in as possible. But we also still are offering that flexibility. We understand that life can throw challenges in, in your direction. You might need to not be in those three days or you might need to go to the doctors or you might need to just work from home to get something done. Because let's be honest, I don't know if everyone agrees here. Productivity when you've come back into the office is like probably dipped because if you're anything like me, you just want to talk to everyone that you've not seen for the last two years. Um, so just giving people that flexibility, but ensuring that the, the office is really the home and the heart of the culture has been the main thing so it's been defining the role of the office in this new wave of working okay interesting so there is this uh, onboarding people back into the office as well uh, yeah i can imagine uh, i actually went to 
town recently on the train and then I caught the wrong train back. So I'm definitely not used to going back to the, to town yet. <laughs> but anyway, Chris, what, what's your uh, what's your perspective? I think I think we because we set our business up virtually in the beginning, probably aren't in a position to say much about how we are. But I think we're observers to, of other organisations, so we're constantly in and out of other businesses. Um, and we were doing a session yesterday with a whole group of people, about um, 250 people who'd come together for the first time in two years to have a, a start year conference. And the CEO, the global CEO, made a really important point, I think. Um, and that was that it's pretty important to take stock of where we've been over the last couple of years and think about the, the positive pieces. Because the default behaviour of most human beings is to do what you've done before and you felt some comfort in. And so what we could do is we could end up just coming back into the office and re-inhabiting the office in a relatively mindless way. And I think that would be a shame because one of the things that I think a lot of organisations are, are, are playing with is that, to Katie's point, the office is a community and it's a place, but what you do there has to be relatively meaningful for, to, you know, for virtue of why would you bother having an office at all otherwise? Because if you simply just come back in, plonk yourself down at a desk, email each other and then go home again, you've achieved really very little. You know, we, we haven't moved on, we haven't learned how to use a space in a collaborative way. And so one of the, one of the ideas that this guy was kicking around yesterday was that Come into the office, but come into the office purposefully to do something together. Or don't come into the office if, in fact, you're better off working solo at home. So I think we need to have a kind of an intelligent thought about why do we go there and what do we do when we get there, other than just being physically proximate to each other in the hope that occasionally we bump into each other at the water cooler and have a kind of interesting conversation. But what do we do? Let's create something that's a, that's a place. I think that's what I'm observing a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, go back to the office, but not just for the sake of going back to the office, mm. but actually having some true meaning behind it and describe it to, to employees. Um, okay, interesting. Um, so the next uh, thing I wanted to explore is the, the AI. You can't really talk about the future of work without the AI. I know we don't have any specialists, uh, AI specialists on the panel. I do think we've got Omar in the audience who is an AI specialist, so I'd love to hear his thoughts maybe after. Uh, but there's a, a ton of research that shows that AI is on track on becoming our work partner uh, and will do things that we don't want to do or we can't do. So how do you think we should prepare for this? Um, so um, Katie, would you like to, would you like to start? Oh, you make me start on the most difficult topic, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, how do you prepare? I mean, it's preparing for any sort of future development. Um, I'm going to give a really woolly answer now because it's not my area of expertise. But I think that we all know that change is ine inevitable. We've all adapted to different ways of working. And if AI can enable us to do the things that really set our souls on fire in terms of um, pushing us into the things that we really value. Um, I think it's, it's only a good thing. One of the things to really come out of the pandemic is that pursuit of purpose and people really feeling like they're getting out of their roles, their purpose, and they're doing something that they feel like they want to be doing. And if AI in, within businesses can enable companies to um, take away the stuff that doesn't give people joy but the parts of the job that they do get joy out of they can do more of then how amazing will that be so i know that's a really woolly answer but i think it's a really interesting one in terms of how we can use technology to really help people deliver the things that they find the most joy in and then create better staff retention because they don't have to look for that elsewhere mm -hmm. okay uh what, what about you chris what, what do you think I think I think we need to be cautious. Um, I think if you look at any sort of um, automation, any sort of use of technology, if AI for me is going to be useful, it allows us to focus more and concentrate more. It doesn't distract us. And I think one of the things that we, we often do when we embrace technology, we, we kind of use it as a form of distraction. Again, if you look at it from a psycholo psychological angle, 
actually that doesn't help us become more productive. There, there isn't really any evidence that continual interruption create to the human mind creates higher levels of thought or productivity. So for AI to work for me, it has to work in the background more. And it actually has to remove distraction rather than create distraction. I'll give you, you know, a kind of very simple example. I've got a lot of clients who are used to using the screen. Fine, we've all got used to using the screen, but quite a lot of them tend to get distracted by what's going on in the screen as well. So, you know, if you're on Teams, for example, rather than Zoom, quite often there are distractions, there are messages popping up, there are other things. And, and, and this kind of continual partial attention disorder that you can get can be made worse by intrusive AI. I think what we're going to have is, is the stuff, and to Katie's point again, yes, it, it provides purpose and, and gives us an opportunity perhaps to be more joyful in what we do and more, more focused, but to do that, it's got to not distract us. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I definitely agree uh, that we live in the world of destructions. Uh, it, uh, yeah, and... Uh, uh, I, I agree with that. It should actually help us be less dis destructed. Um, what about you, Mel? Uh, so you uh, you work in the law industry. Uh, I think legal tech is on the rise now. What, what are your views on, on the AI in the future? Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I've, there are people in my firm who are much more expert than me about all the all the ethical aspects of AI. It's quite an it's really an interesting a really really interesting area. I mean, technology for us is is the future of how we're working with our clients and the sorts of things that we're getting involved with. But I really build on um, Katie and Chris's point around, you know, the value that we are going to get from our clients is the depth of relationships we build. And we can't do that through technology that that's done through human relationships that's done through empathy that's done through things that um, are not able to be replicated so I think what it's done for us actually is it's really brought some of those skills or those development areas to the fore for us because actually that's where we're going to make the difference in terms of really understanding our clients really understanding their their, their concerns really being able to identify the opportunities um, because actually a lot of the things that maybe we were able to do for them in the past, they're not able to do for themselves because of technology. Yeah. So I think it really shifts things up a gear um, and, um, yeah, really puts into stark focus the, 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 the human element and the, the, the importance of um, really being able to build those meaningful relationships. Okay, I think the, the audience likes the answers. Thank you for the questions from Beth, Paul and all. I'll ask those at the end. Um, so, let, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mel. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is the diversity and inclusion. Right. So it's a massive topic. It could be quite nebulous and complex for people who haven't heard of it before. What is diversity? How do we quantify it? How do we know we have diverse teams? Uh, you know, we at your flock, we help teams to uh, define how diverse they are in terms of their values and motivators. And the research shows that actually more diverse teams can be more creative, uh, can be more productive. Uh, so in your experience, uh, let's start with this diversity bit. How do you make sure that your teams are diverse? And I'll start with you, Katie, again, because I know you've, uh, you've grown the business to quite a, quite a few now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I think for us in the world of marketing as well, it would be um, business critical to make sure that you do have a diverse um, diverse thought process as well as, as anything else, because when you're marketing to different target audiences, having the same type of people in the room for every brief um, doesn't work because I'm not ingrained in um, black music culture. For example, one of our clients is Apple Beats, which is one of my Beats head to both. Um, but their target audience is very specific into when we were briefed, it was black music culture and making sure that we could build a team that were authentic within that space was really important. What we've done to do that is try and find people within the industry to bring in for when we've got that type of work. Um, we did it again recently for Amazon Prime. They've got, we, we run their TikTok channel and one of their new shows was Modern Love and they wanted to celebrate love stories around modern love. And we, we built a team around the whole LGBTQ plus community. So the producers, the directors, the um, people that were in the film 
we're all from the community, which makes it really authentic. And for me, when we're building marketing tools, especially for social, where everything is has to be authentic, otherwise people see right through it. It's, it's really important for us to build the most diverse teams as possible. It doesn't mean that they're a full-time employee. It means that we can sometimes bring people in that are freelance that fulfill that brief. Um, but building the teams that are bespoke to the clients and the requirements that we've got has been a really transformational model for us in terms of winning business from different um, with different target audiences. It's not easy, though. And I think we were talking before we uh, before we started in terms of finding the right people isn't always easy. And, and, and I think we've really, we've not, we've not got it perfectly right. And it, it, cause it's, it's a big job, but it's a big job because you've got to t- kind of step back and understand entry points of getting into the industry that you're working in. And where do people come from when they end up falling into the world of marketing? Cause nine times out of 10 people just fall into this world. How do you engage with people at that point and make sure that you've got a really diverse um pool to go after i think one of the great ways of doing it is it, it is obviously making cvs blank c not blank cvs but having them and um, so you don't have people's identities on there so you're not um making judgments without knowing you're making judgments um but it is it's a very tricky one because you've got all the complexities of um cultures areas backgrounds um that can stop people getting into the world that you're working in and trying to make sure that you can be there as an employer um, and demonstrate in the work you're doing to try and attract those people, I think is probably the key. So it, long answer there in terms of a short response is it's really difficult, um, but it yeah. can be possible if you build different ways of, of hiring and working with people. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, and Mel, so you work in the legal industry. Uh, so I guess in there you've got a limited pool of candidates you can recruit. So how do you how do you make sure you you recruit for diverse teams? Yeah, I mean HSF is set out to be the global leading law firm in diversity and inclusion, and it is absolutely fundamental to our values. And our CEO is so inspirational; he lives and breathes it. Justin D'Agostino, if you want to ever look him up. Um, So actually, I think we're very fortunate that it's a genuine desire, but I completely agree with Katie. It is tough because, you know, the legal industry itself is very traditional and there's so many perceived barriers to entry. Um, So for us, we've, you know, we have set ourselves some quite ambitious targets around gender, around race, around social mobility, around ability. Because actually we need to be unpicking a lot of the traditions that maybe have stopped those candidates coming to us or stopped them staying with us. Um, So our approach is really multi-layered. We have, you know, big networks, we have initiatives, but actually it is really about celebrating difference in our teams and really driving that. And so we are not there yet at all. Um, But I think... um, I really think it links to leadership. It really does link link to leadership in terms of what is valued and having those senior role models and and really then starting to see change. And it, you know, I'm not a massive fan of targets, but actually when you see some of the some of the some of those goals and you can see the progress, that gives confidence um, to to you know to people who maybe would think, well, I wouldn't belong there. I think there's a lot that you, that, that, that that we have to do, and I think it's our responsibility absolutely to do that, both in terms of the communities we serve, but also, you know, to to make our firms and our businesses really strong. We absolutely need all the different sorts of talent. So yeah, it's a big value for us. Okay, so it really starts with creating an inclusive culture, so definitely diverse from diverse backgrounds can really you know, feel confident in, in the company. Absolutely. And one other thing that we've done, actually, just to add, which really has seemed to work, is reverse mentoring. I think that's been really powerful for us. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, because actually it's giving people insights into worlds, at, at senior level, into worlds that maybe they wouldn't have come from. Um, and it helps them see that some of the behaviours that they think are just normal or maybe not, et cetera. So, you know, I think that's um, that's that's been a really powerful thing. Okay, thank you, Mel. Uh, and Chris, uh, what about you? Do you help? Uh, do you help other businesses be more diverse? And what, what's 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 your I think, experience? I think we do, and we're not as a business psychology consultancy. We're not experts in diversity. There are 
companies that are far more expert than we are in that field. And I think we have to respect that. Um, but I think where we come to the world of diversity is probably through uh, the lens of psychological safety. So the thing that's become really interesting to us and to many of our clients over the last two years, um, a little bit beforehand, but mostly over the last two years, has been this idea of psychological safety and psychological safety being the sense that I can speak up, I can offer my opinions, uh, I can point out where things aren't going well, or I can point out better ways of doing things. And I won't be in any sense um, humiliated or rejected for so doing. Now, if you think about that, that is the essence, really, of what inclusion truly is. Now, you could be rejected for gross reasons, um, which are largely prejudicial, or you could be rejected because people simply don't understand where you're coming from and can't understand your worldview and aren't tuned into you. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the world of psychological safety, because if you look at the the whole literature of this, there isn't really anything that's more important to team cohesion than a sense of belonging and a sense that I can be me and I can be true to myself without any real danger. So psychological safety for me is kind of made up of a number of, 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 of fairly central um, pillars. One of those pillars is a true appreciation of inclusion and diversity. Another one is creating the conditions in which people can tolerate a degree of failure. Another one is where people can talk about how helpful um, they, they feel the world of work is to them. Because one of the issues I think we've faced over the last couple of years is a, a feeling of psychological isolation as we're kind of working on our own, mm -hmm. worsened by being yeah. on our own. And the last one is openness and, and openness to having a conversation. So those four building blocks are well researched, but we keep coming back to inclusion and diversity. And the, the central question there is, if I truly was myself and I truly spoke up, would I be appreciated or would I run the risk of, of rejection from the group? And that's really, as human beings, what we all fear the most. We fear being rejected from a group that we belong to. And if we don't do something to kind of come up and be ourselves, you know, the, 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 the alternative is usually just being dangerously silent and keeping really good ideas and initiatives private when actually they could be used to the company's advantage. So, you know, there's some great, there's some great humane reasons for being diverse, but there's also some very, very good business reasons as well. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. And I think that's the common theme in here, that inclusion is really important with diversity, because otherwise, if you don't have the inclusion, uh, as you said, Chris, uh, you know, people will just argue or just keep everything to themselves and mm -hmm. you won't have the benefits of the diversity. And yeah, I do think that's even more important to do it when you work in hybrid or in remote because all you have is you and the floating heads on your screen, right? So how do you feel connected and included in the team? Um, okay, so uh, probably last question before we go to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and it's to do with the leadership. So how do you develop the next generation of leaders uh, in this future of work or more remote world? What sort of uh, uh, skills they need to develop and where do they need to spend their time to be successful in the future? And I'll start with you, uh, Chris. Um, I, I think we, we've had a debate for as long as I've ever been working in this area about the difference between a coaching style of leadership and a command and control style of leadership. I don't think that's actually a new, new debate. There's very, very few leaders who would say that command and control is the best way of doing things, except in an emergency, perhaps. But I think there's something slightly more sophisticated that we need to think about, and that's reframing what it is to be a leader. Now, I think where we're going with this is that we're starting to embrace this idea of situational humility. We need people not to simply say, I've got the answers, I've got the direction, rely on me, I'll appraise your performance, I'll essentially create the conditions in which you wait to be told what to do, largely. And we need leaders who see leadership not as a series of activities in order to get a task done, but primarily a number of activities to create relationships. Because I think leadership is a relational act, and I don't think there's any escaping that. I don't think we've ever really spoken enough about it, but... Leadership for me is about setting a direction and it's about helping other people meet their own 
inherent potential, but that's quite a subtle skill. And it's not one that necessarily comes easy to everybody, particularly if you've come up through a technical route where actually you've been always rewarded for having the right answers yourself. And then, you know, you come to the point where you have to let go of that. So I think if we can help leaders refine their relational abilities, which is more than just interpersonal skills and empathy, but it's actually creating conditions in which people can really flourish. I think that's where we need to focus a lot of our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that's great. Humility. I think I've read a book recently about everyone's culture and they mentioned that as well. Mm. Uh, so definitely important. Um, what about you, uh, Katie? Uh, uh, what's your experience at Social Chain with uh, you know, leadership and what do next generation of leaders need to be more successful in the, in the future of work? Yeah, um, it's a really interesting topic for me because I never predicted that I would be in this position as managing director and I was put in this position at the age of 32 um, and it was a real uh, impact on me because of what I perceived leadership to be at that time and not matching my own personality and my values up to what I perceived leadership to be and I think what I have really managed to grapple with over the last five years is how I can create leadership in a different way um, and a lot of that is around the things that I am good at which is empathy and care and being able to help solve problems for people um, and that has been I think the thing that has helped to um, keep the business moving forward and something that got ingrained in the culture of the business as well is um, how we all care about the work and care about the team and care about doing a really good job. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, for the future of leadership, I think I'd like to see that continue. And I think that, that transparency piece that Chris mentioned is really important. I'd never claim to know everything because I think that is what leads you, leaves you open. Um, but also being open and honest about your own mental health struggles or you, if you feel comfortable doing that, of course. But it's helped me feel more human to the team and, and the people that I speak to um, to enable them to feel like they can come to us because it is such a big thing that impacts your work in life if something's going on in your own personal life. So just me being me basically is what I've found as a leader. I think the future and the next generation um, of leadership needs to really understand that mental health and and support is, is a big thing that needs to be pushed forward for a team, whether that is virtually or whether that, I think it's going to have to be a hybrid. All these tech platforms that are coming out now to help um, mental health support, understand who you are, understand where you want to get to. Um, and, and as a leader, having that knowledge and I think not to plug your flock, but I think that's one of the reasons that it does work so well, because as a leader, you can know people on a personal level of what their drivers are to help them personally develop in a way that they're going to keep happy and interested in the work in their career. And I think that is the thing uh, as a future leader is being open, honest and really understanding people on a personal development. My voice is going to be the key to success. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, uh, I love the fact that you mentioned your flock and the future leader and the future of work. That's uh, that's great. And, you know, I love the fact that you said uh, that we need to be more human. I think it relates nicely to what Chris mentioned about creating a culture of psychological safety for that in the first place. Um, so, Mel, what about you? You mentioned uh, a little bit about the importance of leadership. Uh, what do you think this leadership needs to be like to uh, to fit with the future of work? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to just repeat what Chris and Katie have said, but, but I absolutely agree with everything they said. Um, the, the other dimension, I think, for us is developing that curiosity in our leaders. So actually, it's not about, you know, we've got experts, you know, who, who want to be right and want to be perfect. And, you know, actually being comfortable with ambiguity, being comfortable with things not being perfect, trying things, exploring things. And I think that's such a shift for people who've been drilled in a real um, expertise driven model. Um, I think the pandemic and all of the changes that we have been through recently have sort of helped people see that, that you know, we've got to 
we've got to learn, we've got to unlearn habits that we had before, we've got to explore, we've got to be, be open to that. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is actually this takes work and it takes investment and you've got to, rather than seeing a, being a leader as something extra to what you, to your day job, it's an integral part of who you are and, and how are you going to really invest in that um, and invest in your own development and growth. Coaching, I think for me is massive in terms of helping people have the opportunity to um, to unlock the potential in themselves and others. I think that's I think that's absolutely critical and key. So the the profile of leaders uh, is interesting. Just before I came on this, uh, we were just looking at some of these sort of from two statements, and I think the profile of our future leaders is going to be so different um, yeah. because the, you know it's about relationships, it's about collaboration, it's about sharing with others rather than being the one person that you know the, the single point of expertise and failure. So um, yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's it, it's a very different position. Yeah, I, I guess your industry is probably moving from keeping everything to yourself and being mm. very, uh, not sharing anything to now moving to full transparency. And I guess, yeah, that's a massive culture uh, shift, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But, so exciting times. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions from the audience. Uh, so I'll, I'll read them out and let's move on to the questions from the audience. So the first one is from Bev Wood. Um, and uh, it says, what is the panel's view on the long-term impact on home working for business in town cities who rely on workers to sustain their business. Um, so anyone would like to take it or should I pick one of you? <laughs> so the question is effectively, what is the long-term impact of home working for businesses who really rely on uh, staff uh, to, to work at, at the office? Uh, so uh, Chris, would you like to take it? I don't know that I've necessarily got a particularly informed view on this because I think I probably know no more about this than anybody else, really. Um, if you've got a business, I think, which relies on a particular habit, a particular behaviour, and you expect that habit and behaviour to stay static over time, you might be very fortunate and you might end up mining a really rich and narrow vein but you might also become overly specialized and you might actually become a bit of a victim of change circumstances. So the only thing I can say as a psychologist is that at the end of the day, what defines human success quite often is not drive and ability and sheer resilience and determination. It's often adaptability. And I think, I think, if you're reliant on people doing something in a particular way and they just cease to do that, you might very well have a problem. So I think you've probably got to think a little bit more broadly and be prepared to be adaptable. That might sound like a bit of an obvious answer, but it's the only answer I can really give. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, I mean, over the pandemic, so many businesses took a step back on how they can adapt to, uh, you know, completely evolve their business. Um, so yeah, um, anyone else wants uh, wants to add anything to that question? My only point of view on it really is like the benefits to the local businesses around. So Manchester, we're based in Manchester city centre. I'm in the office now, this isn't my home. Um, and uh, being back in town and, and seeing the buzz that's going on in town is really nice. And I think people are enjoying it when they're here. I think someone likened it the other day to the six week holidays when you're in school that week before you go back you really don't want to go back to school and like, oh, no, I don't want to go back in and then as soon as you're in and you're back with your friends again you absolutely love it and you realize why um and I think just seeing the I think wherever your office is whether you're in a town or whether you're out of town just having people back together again is a, is a real joy for culture and and, and seeing that thrive. But yeah, it's it's nice to see Manchester a little bit busier again. Okay, thank you. So next question is from Paul Pilling. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so Paul agrees uh, that there is an importance of face-to-face -face and collaboration in an office space. Uh, but his question is, would it, uh, would it feel forced by saying it must be used X days per week? 
I'll pick this up if you want because I have put in okay. a post three days a week. So the reason that I did that is because we have a number of happiness and culture initiatives that we want to make sure is happening in the office. Um, so when we're looking at budgeting and making sure we've got the right amount of food or the right amount of beverages or the right, um, and then we're paying for potential panel speakers to come in and educate the teams. Um, we want to know that people are going to be here for it rather than it just be um, a choice. So yeah, for me, it might seem like it is forced by saying three days a week um but it's really it is for the culture because we want to make sure people in the office is buzzing again and um, it's not to make the work any better because we know we can do it it really is to make sure that our happiness manager who is honestly one of the most organized and best people that we've had in the business can do her job properly and she can't do that if people aren't in the office so yes it, it's an interesting question and it did feel weird after being such a flexible culture to dictate a number of days that we expect to see people in but really it is to make the office come back to life yeah i mean i'll, I'll also answer that a little bit as well um our agile or three days a week policy if you like it is underpinned by a set of principles um so i think there, there is flexibility within that, that 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 we expect teams to to work together on the other thing that we've done in a lot of our locations is that we've redesigned the office so that actually collaboration and those opportunities happen a bit naturally, organically, rather than us having to say, we're going to put a big event on, come in. It, it, the fact that you come in it, to a, a broad collaborative space, it, it sort of is facilitating that anyway and by design. Um, and hopefully that will grow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a difficult subject, right? People are used to working from home 24 seven. And now again, going back to the office, I guess we need to be very delicate around the process. Um, I, think, I think we might need to pay particular attention if we do this to how we structure the office. And I think if, if we encourage, I think encouragement is probably better than kind of pushing people, but even if it's strong encouragement, but if we encourage them back into the office, which is a series of gray cubicles, where they didn't particularly feel very creative or very inspired or very collaborative in the first place, well, then don't be surprised if they're a bit resistant to coming back. But if you create the environment in which they want to come back because it feels good and it's a great place to be, which is largely about behaviour, it is a little bit about design as well, then maybe you'll get, you'll, 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 you know, you'll get greater in appreciation, you'll get larger numbers of people coming back. So I think we haven't put enough attention aside to the physical design of offices for years. And if you think about it, you look at the average office, it's a pretty depressing place, a bit like a, a kind of abattoir of the human soul, really. You know, you don't go in there to feel cool and feel good unless it's been specifically designed like that. You wouldn't go into a hotel if you had the choice and you had the money. You wouldn't go to a hotel that you didn't like the look of, that was purely functional, particularly if you're on holiday. You might on business, but you probably wouldn't on holiday. But we've got to create a little bit more intelligence into the physical design of the office, I think, to, to create the, the hub and the vibrancy that people want to go back to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you for those answers. Uh, we've got another one from Escher Rubin, and it's about bias uh, and, uh, I think, recruitment. So... Uh, Escher says, uh, great to hear that reducing bias, increasing diversity is a priority. I'm interested to hear from the panel about hiring for fit and their predictions on the future tools uh, hiring managers may use besides the CVs. Uh, anyone want to take it? Well, I suppose I should start because that's partly our business. That's, yeah, exactly, Chris. You <laughs> have other businesses, sense, doesn't it? it? Yeah. Um, it depends what you mean, whether you mean a, 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 a selection tool or a sifting tool. So I think, you know, there's all sorts of biases that exist in sifting, as we all know, many of which we wouldn't want to even admit because they're quite unconscious. Um, we couldn't admit because they're unconscious. But if we go down to the actual selection, thing, what, do you, what do you do after um, you've looked at somebody on paper? And let's say you've got something that's very neutral, so you, and no biases come in and you just look at the paper evidence, you think, right, that person looks worth meeting and you meet them 
what do you do? Do you have an interview with them, uh, a structured interview, non-structured interview, or do you try and get a little bit more into the, 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 the you know, the depth of the person? Now, there's always a thing about money and time with this, and the more senior the job is, the more risky the job is, the more time you tend to put into it. But I think the intelligent use of things which shed light on the, the kind of internal workings of the person, they could be psychometrics, it could be carefully designed exercises, they could be gamification, and, you know, where you, you, you're, you're in, going into something that looks like a scenario, usually done on a phone these days in a kind of almost like a game environment, where we get a bit of a sense about what makes the person tick. Because I think if you're going to hire for fit and you're going to do it properly, you've inevitably got to go a bit deeper. And if you're going a bit deeper, you've got to do it in a way that you can afford and that you can scale up. But it's worth being a bit more intelligent about how you get into the, you know, to the underpinnings of a person, underneath the, the bit that's underneath the top of the iceberg that represents values and mm -hmm. culture and ways of working and style and all the other good things that don't necessarily come out on a CV or even just in an hour-long, simple, unstructured interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the rest of the panel? What are your views on... Uh, on recruitment, on recruitment for FET and what sort of tools you can use to, to do that? We've always tried to recruit on, um, and I know Dan's putting there about not it just being a culture fit, but I think yeah. from a culture fit perspective, we have always tried to find, we've got really solid values at Social Chain. We always have had that have been organic since the beginning of the company and they relate to a bunch of behaviours that we what we want everyone to adhere to and we've really used those values in order to hire people um, and I think that has been one of the successes of the company and the values are really around mindset and understanding that people really care and so we've we've really focused on that from a hiring perspective but in terms of the future of how to find people with the world that we work in and it being social media and it changing every single minute of the day, we um, have found our best recruits through people who've sent in really creative applications. So whether that's they've created TikToks or we found people on TikTok more recently, um, looking at people who really live and are, um, are ingrained in social already um, has been really crucial to the, to the hires um, that we found. So in terms of the hiring process, that's probably what I would say um, mm -hmm. from a social chain perspective. Okay, and Mel, I know that you are now creating a remote team uh, yeah. in your business and uh, using your flock as well to support the workings of it. But how do you recruit, uh, you know, when you work, uh, for example, remotely? What do, what do you pay attention to? Um, I think for us, we've done a big piece on educating our recruiters around you know, what is inclusivity and, you know, what do those practices actually mean and things to, to watch out for. So we're really, we're really um, plugged into making sure that we have diverse recruitment panels um, around that. Um, uh, it's a difficult question to ask in terms of the purely remote people, because actually in the last two years, all the recruitment we've been done, uh, we've been doing, people have ended up being remote. Yeah. So, um, it, come back to me on that question I think in the, <laughs> in the future but I think for us um with the inclusion agenda I think it's partnering as well with with the right organizations who can help us think about what schemes we can have that are going to be the most welcoming for people from different backgrounds so it's not just a one-size-fits-all you've got to go through a standard interview process because that might not bring out the you know the the, the behaviors and, and the potential that, that individuals have yeah, I, I think that the overall topic of recruitment is super important, especially with the great resignation, you know, everyone now moving between jobs. Uh, so hopefully the audience liked the answers and felt inspiring. So I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, I'm going to go for a question from Al. Uh, and Al uh, ask, uh, his question is, how do the panel create time and space in your own working patterns to just be or lead or think? Uh, is that harder or easier in developing hybrid working environments? So how do you, you know, manage your own working style? When do you, you know, when you need to lead or think or be, how do you do it in this, you know, hybrid or remote environment? 
Um, Katie, would you like to start? I was laughing because I'm probably not the right person to speak to because <laughs> I don't think I do it very well. And it is something that I've been trying to work on. I think it's been the hardest two years as a leader. Like, I don't think, I'm hoping that we never have to face this again and trying to navigate working uh, or helping a team navigate their own. Um, everyone's individual circumstances working from home, whether that's they're trying to um, homeschool or whether that's they live on their own or whether they live in a flat and they can't get any outside space. Um, and uh, I think it's been the toughest and most reactive time as a leader that meant that it's really difficult to find your own time within that. Um, and I've personally felt that quite heavily. Um, but that is something that I am also working on for um, myself. Um, it's it's definitely harder but I, I think being productive I found that hybrid way of working means that when I'm in the office I can be really present with the team and then when I'm working from home I can do the things that I need to concentrate on whether that's mm. forecasting or whether that's finance or the things that don't require you to be there and present and I found that um, being in the office means that I can be more present with the team than I probably could have been before um, but it is, it's a work in progress, so that's why I was laughing, because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel the same. <laughs> so what about you, Mel? How do you find that the right balance? Yeah, I think it, I think it is a challenge. I mean, I mean obviously working in, in learning and development, I feel like I can be doing my job and developing, you know, looking at things that, you know, that, that interests me. I think that really helps me. And that's my flow, if you like, really, you know, really, really enjoying that. For me, what's worked is putting some structure around my days um, and making sure that, you know, I do get out, I do a run, I do get the fresh air. And, and, I'm, and I'm not thinking, well, I'm, oh, my, my best thinking can happen only when I'm staring at a screen or look, working on a laptop. I think it's being freer and giving myself the permission just to to know what will, in, will enable me to have the best thoughts. But I'm, and I wouldn't say I'm, a, I'm an expert on it, but that, that'd be, that, that's my thing. OK, thank you. And what about you, Chris? Have you got that balance? I, you're still working you know what? It's a quite alarming and slightly disturbing admission that um, even though we talk a huge amount in our business about well-being, uh, even though we've written a book called Mind, Body and Balance, um, I'm still guilty sometimes of just not taking my own medicine. And I think we're all in that boat, really. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've learned, um, and exactly the same as Mel, I don't need to be in front of a screen to do the best work. And I, I don't want to be in this world where I go and I don't have a huge number of, you know, because this is a small company with a lot of associate labor. So we're not, we're not, we don't have all the corporate stuff that, that you guys have to put up with, but I can't let my world be dictated by 30 minute chunks by teams of video calls. You know, that is not a healthy way to live. Um, and so many people have fallen into that trap. They're giving themselves so little space. And I found myself doing it as well. Right at the start of the pandemic, I've never been more knackered in my life because I was just out half hour after half hour after half hour, you know, and it was just relentless. And I think step away from the screen, step away from the screen, step away from the phone and just find some space because you're still thinking, you're still doing quality stuff. The whole world isn't about typing. It isn't about answering things, you know, in a reactive way. It really is about finding some 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 space. Even if when you're asleep, quite honestly, your subconscious mind is still processing stuff. Just give it some space to do it. Okay, well, what a way to finish the the discussion. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I completely agree. Unfortunately, though, we are running out of time. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, I know we've got a few more questions to ask. Uh, I will. Um, I'll, I'll write down those questions and then hopefully we will be able to get you the answer uh, after uh, the chat. But thank you for engaging uh, in the conversation. Thank you all lovely panelists to, you know, uh, spend an hour of to, uh, today to, you know, uh, have this important chat. Hopefully we were able to inspire you a little bit today. Uh, and I hope you find it useful and engaging. So if you'd like to connect with any of the panelists, or if you would like to find out more about your flock, how we can help your team leaders save time and engage employees, feel free to get in touch. We would love to facilitate that networking. Uh, there will be more events in the future. 
uh, that we will uh, we we will definitely do probably next one in March. Uh, so stay tuned. We don't have a date yet. Uh, but again, I hope you enjoy this event. Uh, thank you all for making the time uh, and enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the week.